Yeah, I mean, here's the text, so we can double check. But yeah, she has a presentation on the flash drive, so we can just put it into the kit. And I'm going to show you one so I think it's put it on the desktop. Yeah, put it on the desktop.
Conversation. In fact, what we're doing is we're, again, improvising because of certain circumstances. Um, again, to go back to the words of Carrie this morning, we're having to think about not only um, um, the kinds of ways that we're dealing with precarity, but we're also dealing with people's um, different positions of vulnerability in their own locations, and also the need to always, always operate with uh, understanding contingencies. So, um, 
So we decided that we're going to proceed in a slightly different manner. Um, so I'm really delighted to uh, welcome Glenna Matouche, who is a visual artist from Montreal. Glenna is a Jibwe, and Glenna is now blind. Glenna also has visions, and she has dreams, and she has ways of working. Uh, her work has been uh, shown in national connection, uh, collections across the country, and we're really pleased that she's able to be here with us uh, today, but also she's been working with Emily and Waha, who I will introduce in a minute, and also Annie, but in a collaborative way. So I think we're here to deal with ways that when we think about disability, we also have to deal with different kinds of intersections of relations of power and history and how they both how they impinge and affect the different conditions we have of working together but also the ways that, that um, these communities and indigenous communities also um, open up new pathways for us to think in a very hopefully self-reflexive ways of our own position as people living in white settler societies in places like montreal so um, we also have with us um, Emily Monet, who also is an artist, a performer, half Anishinaabe, half French. Uh, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this correct, Emily, so if I get it wrong, correct me. Recently, she had an amazing performance at the Centre de Théâtre d'Aujourd'hui called Okinobi. Okinobi. Um, Emily um, has been working for 13 years with someone, and also Glenna said to me something really interesting. She said, we're all here because of Waha. And unfortunately, Waha Nina, who was supposed to be here for particular contingencies and circumstances, has not been able to be here. But she's very much here with us in uh, spirit. And, and she, oh, she's here with us in Skype. Hi, Waha. <laughs> Do the wonders of technology, Wanda will be with us. Um, and uh, Wanda is someone who, if you've ever met her, has an amazing presence. Uh, and I'm going to be interested to see how that translates through this technology. And if anybody can do it, I know Wanda can. But Wanda is a community leader and an artist and a writer and an activist. And she's also done really fantastic radio work in her community uh, over a, a number of years as well, from my conversations with her who lives in the Amazon in Colombia. Um, and finally, I want to welcome and thank uh, her for, for being here, Melanie Obamsman, who's part of this amazing and incredible team. Qui vient de Montréal, l'origine de Danac, artiste multimédiatique. So again, the majority of our conversations are in English here, mais aussi si des personnes, les gens qui veulent travailler par en français, Vous êtes bienvenue, mais aussi si on a besoin de des traductions pour les gens, les membres d'audience ici qui parlent seulement anglais, on peut vous aider. Mais aussi, on a la traduction Amer uh, American Sign Language, langue de signes québécoise, and so we've got at least four languages operating in this room at all times, which is <laughs> quite something. So, um, and then we're going to um, uh, talk with uh, Emily Waha. Lena and Melanie are going to talk about their collective project that they're working on and share it with us today. And Faye Ginsberg, who's from NYU, and has been working uh, at the intersections of uh, critical disability studies and the media for a number of years, um, and also in alliance with indigenous communities, um, um, especially uh, with art, uh, indigenous artists who work in media. Um, she's the coordinator of the new Center for Disability Studies, and directs the Center for Media and Culture and History at NYU. And she's been involved in establishing Native American and Indigenous Studies at NYU and showcasing Indigenous media work in collaboration with the National Museum of the American Indian in the United States for a number of years. So she's going to also uh, offer some comments and help to uh, coordinate a conversation and discuss it. So I welcome all of you to, well, you're already at the stage, but to take the mic away from me now okay, and go. Hello everyone, Kwe, Ani. Um, so yes, my name is Emily, and uh, first 
And all I want to say a big thank you to Kim. It's really great to be there. She had invited Waida. Waida was actually supposed to be here um, with us, but she wasn't able to get on the plane because her mom is quite sick. And it was also um, a one year anniversary since the, um, the killing of her brother. So the day that she was supposed to travel, so her mom was who was already sick was very feeling very um, very sad. So they were worried she wouldn't have the energy to continue to fight. So then the decision was not to travel. So thank you, Kim, though, for this uh, opportunity and also for funding this project that uh, I will be talking about. Um, we met Kim through the Consortium for Performance and Politics in the Americas. So we've been to uh, a few encuentros, me and Waira. And uh, last year in Winnipeg, we did what I call uh, performative conversations. We presented one of them to talk about our project and where we were going. And then uh, following this, uh, every, all the universities kind of chipped in to kind of uh, enable us to travel to the Amazon and, uh, and uh, make this project. So I will tell you a little bit uh, quickly what the project is about. Me and Waira have been working since 2012 towards um, creating a performance piece that will be uh, hopefully in, a, in, a, in its finished version for 2020. It's like a, um, it's like a, a performative uh, roaming performance and with six sound installations that look at uh, bridging the teachings of the women in our communities, both Anishinaabe, Algonquin, and uh, Inga in Colombia, and also in the context of uh, mining extractions and how this the violence and uh, war has uh, shut down our voices and our responsibilities as indigenous women to care for the land and the water. So this is the big project. But within the project, the project is um, also a platform for exchanges between indigenous communities and indigenous artists from Canada and uh, in Colombia. So four years ago, no, five years ago, eh, Luna? Oh, six years ago. <laughs> Six years ago, uh, Glenna traveled with me to the Amazon and, uh, and led uh, a workshop in abstract painting with the children at the school. Um, the school in Yurayako, the community where Waida is from, is a very um, special place because it is, uh, they had, the elders had a vision to uh, create a school to form the, the, the leaders for the next generation to make sure that they get their teachings uh, in their language. Uh, that the worldview, the Inga worldview is infused in everything, which means, uh, which means also their connection to the invisible and to, uh, to, to, to the creator. So spirituality and ceremonies is very much a big part of their way of life. And uh, children at the school engage in ceremony every, every week, basically. And uh, I won't tell too much about this experience because it's a beautiful story and it's kind of the starting point um, for this project that happened last year and I think I, I'm wanting Glenna to tell you about it. But um, in December last year, we were invited uh, to make the illustrations of a book that Waida is or wrote and that will be published next year. It's called La Vida es una Pinta, Life is But a Vision. And it uh, retells the stories of her growing up in ceremonies with her father, her mother, um, her grandfathers or great-grandfathers who were all Taitas. And Taitas in Colombia are, or in Inca culture are medicine people. And they're the one that uh, uh, lead the ceremonies of ambiwaska, so they take a, a medicine. Um, and uh, and so Waira wrote a book of all her her, her lived experience as a little girl uh, being with uh, in ceremony. And the book is so beautiful. Those stories are so precious. And. Uh, and then we were, or Glenna was asked to help make the illustrations. Um, I can say that within the context of Colombia, I think for me that's also, I'll show some images and then I'll, I'll let Glenna kind of uh, explain more about uh, the experience. But um, 
just 36 hours before we flew to Colombia, uh, we had the news that Mario, so Moira's oldest brother, was uh, brutally killed and tortured. His body was found uh, for being a, a community leader, and he's uh, the one that was really uh, negotiating with uh, mining companies in, uh, in the territory. And so, um, this is, uh, since I've known Waida, this is the second killing of her, her brothers. Um, and uh, so, um, well, we talked right away, and I was like, well, we're, we're, we're not gonna go. We're not gonna go, but I will go anyways, because she's, she's one of my best friends, and I wanted to be uh, there for her and her family. And, um, and then uh, a few hours later, she called me back or she messaged me and she says, can you get on Skype? I'm here with my mom, the director of the school, my sister, uh, and my uh, partner, Flora, who's also the director of the school. And so I hooked up on Skype and then they had this council of women um, asking me, please come because school was finished and there was like 13 children that were asked to stay at the school because most of the children come from different communities and they come to Yurayako for the school year. So they were staying to make the illustrations of Wider's book. And there was also two elders, Taitas, that were traveling from uh, other communities in the Amazon that were already on their way to um, be there and accompany the, the process of making those illustrations. So we were asked, please come. You know, things, we, life goes on, and uh, if you don't come, all we'll do is cry. So please come. And so this was a decision, so I called, I called Glenna. There's also, we were four women. Uh, Patty Shaughnessy is also uh, another indigenous artist, Anishinaabe from Kerflik. She lives in Peterborough, and a good friend of, uh, of us, and Glenna too. And uh, yes, so I called them one by one, and I, I called Glenna first because uh, she's also very close to Waida, and I said, well, this is the situation. Mario was just killed. Um, this is a part of Colombia that is very, um, it's the cradle for the FARC, the, a lot of guerrilleros movement. Uh, the, the communities of the region have been really, uh, really touched by, 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 by war. And uh, and then right away, when I said, uh, "Let's go, right?" <laughs> and so and then I called Patty, and Patty said, "Let's go." And I called Melanie, and Melanie said, "Let's go." So we left as it was planned, and uh, this experience was uh, very profound, uh, very meaningful, very. Uh, very, very, very beautiful experience. So I'll show you some images that Melanie, Melanie, who's a filmmaker, um, will be making a documentary, but also um, in the performance, we want to have a, a documentary uh, component to uh, to our, our project. It really follows me and Wyatt and our, our friendship. Um, and uh, and uh, so I'll show some images. Uh, they're pretty rough uh, images because we haven't edited them. And the idea was during this residency was for me and Waida to look over the material and kind of create performative responses to the film material. But right now you'll see, uh, you'll see it raw. Thank you. 
Joy was all about. Yeah. 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 We ran them with your pencil. This is Waida's mom. She's a, she's a very important elder in the community. Her name is Nati. And uh, she even, after losing her son, she, she wanted to be, uh, to be part of the workshop and paint. It's nice. Uh, yeah. And the image that we see in the back is Mario. And this is Waida with Glenna, with the glasses. So Glenna was teaching us to um, also do collage with beads on top of the paintings and using mixed shift materials. And this is uh, this was our studio. This is the technique with the beads. Oh yeah, that's funny. I like this part. <laughs> Glenna painting. We're preparing the canvas for the children to paint on, on top of it.
it's not edited, so, okay. And here is, like, it's showing how we're... This is Patty. So our role were, was also to be Glenna's eyes and help her um, explain what, what the painting was. And then Glenna was giving indications and I was translating. So you see all the children. <laughs> kind of helping. Glenna painting. Um, oh yeah. Just dry it. You can you can take up a stick and you can make, you can make marks in it too. And so now the, we put some gel medium on the paintings, and now they were drying up. It's quite humid in the Amazon. And then we did uh, an exhibit at the school. And so we are preparing. And uh, there's going to be a ceremony for the occasion. This is the medicine man. For, especially for the school, for the children. So he's a young medicine man, young uh, Taika. And Santi is one of his helpers. So we were going between English and Spanish and sometimes Inca. So this was actually at the beginning of the workshop. We had a ceremony to open the space and we had a ceremony at the end. So this is at the end. So this is the end ceremony. Oh, <laughs> 
for us it's very special because we see that the ways are very similar. How we open space, we take care of space, the circle. They use different plants, but they have a similar uh, way of doing things than us in the north. And then it was the space for uh, children <laughs> to show their paintings and to retell the stories because through Waida's book, it is, a, a, it is also an educational tool for the children to also learn about their um, culture. And it was fascinating to see the children talking about abstraction <laughs> And they, they kind of got it, and uh, and telling and retelling the stories, retelling the stories. Okay, so this is like um, it's not edited right now, but it gives you a little idea of the setting. And I also just uh, wanted to show you um, maybe another video. It's more uh, just about Glenna, so you kind of get to see Glenna, how she would hike in the jungle being blind. <laughs> so we would be blind as eyes. So we did this trek, we had to walk for two hours in the jungle. And so, you know, and at the end, you were pretty, um, we would tell you, oh, uh, this was the bridge. That was a, maybe that was a good thing you weren't seeing. <laughs> it was quite a bridge. It was very, very deep. We were all down. So, this was, it was a yes. Everybody was scared. <laughs> and so to get there, because it was a two-hour trek in the jungle to go to the birthday party of uh, this elder. I guess the little girl doesn't like it too. Yeah, everybody was scared. And um, so Glenna, we put her on a horse. It was more like a donkey, eh, Glenna? <laughs> so Glenna said, I'm not going back on the donkey to go back. So we have to find a solution. How are we going to bring Glenna back to the village? Because we were two hours away, there was no way we could hike with her. Well, we could, but it would have taken us uh, <laughs> a long time. This is the kind of uh, trail, right? So. So, uh, looks like that. So then, because same as us, rivers are highways there, so we decide, okay, well, we'll bring Glenna down the river. But it is a river that's a very, uh, uh, lots of rapids, lots of, uh, this is a donkey. <laughs> He's a small kid, so you can imagine Glenna with the long legs on that. So this was the solution. But Glenna on the two. Uh, 
I am. Well, this is pretty calm waters, though. I don't know if you're, I don't know if we have cuts of the, yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> and sometimes it's so shallow, eh? You could, could you feel the rocks on your bum? So we went down the river like that for uh, an hour. to take it off, I'm going to get my finger uh, ripped off. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so, uh, okay, well, those are images just for you to, uh, to see, but now I think uh, I'll give the word to Glenna, or maybe, I don't know if they want to join us, or how, however, uh, however that's the best. And if you want to find more information about our project, I have also um, a page here, it's in development. And it's called, uh, our project is called uh, Migabon. Okay, it won't open, so too bad. But um, those are some of the images with the children. Okay, here it is. So this is the project with Waida. And we have a little documentary. This was during a residency that we did at Oboro during Encuentro Hemispheric uh, Encuentro when it was here in Montreal at Concordia. And uh, you'll see there's a documentary about the process and the project. So if you're interested, you can just uh, go on the page. But uh, um, I'll let uh, Glenna and uh, speak now. <coughs> well, Glenna, can you tell us uh, how did you come to do these images? Can you tell us a story about that? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for being here. And thank you for Kim for inviting us here. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, uh, we first, uh, when I first met uh, Emily, uh, a few years later, we talked about uh, going to heal, going to see healers in uh, Ontario, and uh, and uh, and later on. Uh, after she had gone to uh, Colombia, she told me about uh, other healers in Colombia that maybe I could go to see. So, uh, so we ended up going to uh, <coughs> to Colombia, and uh, that was our first trip six years ago. And uh, during the time, uh, during that time. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> 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 the time, it was my first uh, visit to uh, South America, and uh, the first time in the jungle, and, uh, and so um, I was looking forward to, to uh, taking ayahuasca at that time, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, and uh, so I was really into it because it was also a healing form, okay? <laughs> and I'm a person who doesn't take pot, never took pot at all. And uh, I tried it, but it didn't agree with me. It was good. And uh, so we went to the ceremony, and uh, okay, I had the half one. A half a cup, okay? <laughs> and I was the first one to take it. And so I had my uh, hammock. Yeah, hammock, and I rested there, and nothing happened. So it was a disappointment to me going to the ceremony. But the next night, I said, okay, I'll be brave. And uh, this ceremony starts around midnight, okay? Because we all relax first, and some people sleep, and and, uh, but I was awake in anticipation. Okay, it was my turn, they called me, and it took a 
full glass. And okay, I'm going to lie down in my hammock. And as soon as I hit the hammock, everything went black. I couldn't see anything. Of course, it was night, okay? Too late. <laughs> but I couldn't see anything. I said, hey, I'm blind. I'm blind. Something's happening here. So I went to the ground there where Emily was sleeping on the ground, and I lay beside her, and, and Wyda was right there in her hammock, and I'm, they are both there, and I'm hanging onto, onto their, both their arms, their wrists, and I'm, something weird is happening to me. I think my body is disappearing. Like it's, I can't feel my body. And I think I saw kids around me. I don't know if they were actually there, their faces. And I said, I started calling for my mummy. <laughs> mummy, <laughs> I don't want my mummy. He was like a little kid. I want my mummy. He was like a little rat. I want my mummy. And they're trying to calm me down. And he said, no, nope, I want my mummy. And uh, so this went on for hours, OK? And finally, I said, I have to go to the toilet. So then they came with me to the toilet. And I almost fell asleep there because there was water trickling next door, OK? And I said, it's so peaceful that I can't hear anything in my head or feel my body. or Nothing worries me in the world. Just, I'm concentrating on that water running. And it was just calming me down. And it calmed me down. And everything went away, all, all the ayahuasca. And I said, never again. <laughs> never again. So I did try it. I did try, uh, I went through the ceremony and um, but it just didn't agree with me. I didn't have a chance, didn't have a chance to work on my eyes in addition. And uh, so then uh, later on the next, the following year, no, four years later or five years later. So then you did a workshop with the children? Oh yes, I did a work with the children and um, I work with, uh, with you know, from little boys, little children, four-year-olds to about uh, 10, 11, uh, 10, 11 year, years old. And we didn't have much uh, equipment. We just had a few uh, paints and uh, a few brushes. But most of the time, they had to work with uh, found objects, like little stick, and they could do their drawings. What kind of drawings? Uh, I think they were they were making uh, stories of their dreams, of their ayahuasca dreams, because they were in ceremony too, from uh, very young to starting at four years old. They take part in the uh, ayahuasca ceremony ceremonies, so they were doing uh, images of their dreams and. Um, so they really got into it, yeah. And um, and we didn't, like I said, we didn't have too much uh, paints. But there was one little boy who would uh, have his little stick. He go walk over the t uh, the uh, on the chairs, walk all around the chairs where somebody was sitting. The kids were sitting, walk around and go get dip his. Uh, I was taking the paint and go back the same way to where he was to continue. <laughs> Did he repeat that? I don't know how many times. And, and later on, uh, six, five, six years later, he's a very good artist and uh, and a good, uh, a good, really a good person who was uh, helping the uh, yeah the Titans. And, uh, and that's when White asked you, eh? Yeah. So, so um, we did that. I did that with the children, and uh, and I showed them works, uh, my my paintings. Uh, I talked about my work, and I showed them I images. And uh, and then later uh, we came back. Uh, we went back exactly a year ago. Uh, we went back to uh, Colombia. Because I, they asked me to, um, White asked me to do illustrations uh, for her book, and uh, 
I said, no, I can't do it. I can't see. My, my vision is really poor. And um, she said, Glenn, I, I won't uh, have a book. I won't have a book bench to this, because I only want you. <coughs> so I said, uh, well, okay, I'll go then. So I thought nothing of it, actually. I thought, oh, well, it'll happen. It'll happen. One way or another, it'll happen, okay? And I had confidence in myself and in the children. And uh, so I kind of planned what I was going to do in my head. I, I took some uh, canvas, prepared some, and I had ideas. And um, so we went uh, back to Colombia and uh, we, we rested for a while because we had to acclimate ourselves to the climate because it was so hot. It was very, very hot. And, uh, that's when we took that journey. And uh, the horse, but later I found out it was a burrow. <laughs> I couldn't see it. <coughs> I was very proud to tell the story. But I, was, I climbed the mountain when I was there. and. Uh, I went on a suspended bridge all by myself with the horse. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, we, uh, we started our classes with the children. And um, Wyda would first uh, tell me the story, read me the story. Emily would translate. And, uh, and then, and then uh, every day she would tell the story. Uh, she'd read the story to the children. And I said, well, you guys can figure out. Uh, at first, they were doing the whole ther uh, the whole story, OK, on one page. But then uh, M and Melanie pointed out that they were doing the whole uh, story in illustration. So I told them to um, pick one um, image from the story. Don't look at your other, don't look at your friends to see what they're doing. Do your own thing, I said. So they uh, picked an image. and. Um, so it, got, it was improved. It improved. And, uh, yeah. Why don't you put it there? Hello, Wala. What was the most rewarding thing of doing this workshop for you? It was um, seeing the work of the children, the art at the end, especially, especially in the last couple of days, and the work they did was very amazing. And, uh, I don't know if they have any separate. I don't know if they have any 
separate um, photos of just the images of the paintings. Yes, I showed some. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Where you'll, you'll see them. <coughs> and um, well, I like the calmness in the community and uh, how um, I like the calmness about the community and uh, how they're just concentrating on uh, studying and. Uh, about it, and, uh, <coughs> and the friend, friendliness of the people, and uh, like better than home, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we've done a little bit of much about your future plans of working together. Um, I wonder if you would uh, Hey, do you want to join at the front still, yeah. maybe? Um, yes, well, uh, maybe while I look for the video, uh, Glenna, did you feel that being visually impaired was a limit for you or no? No, it, there was no barrier. There was really no barrier because uh, I could see some images and I could also feel the images. Somehow, it, it, uh, I was pleased with the work especially during the last two days when they worked on the, the canvas, the prepared canvas. Humphrey? Mm -hmm. and, uh, when I was there, I'll talk about when I was there, okay? That's good. Okay. Um, well, we were talking to Glenna. Uh, Glenna is one of my favorite people in the world, and uh, and so uh, I I do a lot of projects with uh, her. Where we travel a lot together, and we have another project that we're actually going to be uh, showing again in the spring. Um, it's a project that uh, I also run a festival called Indigenous Contemporary Scene. And two years ago, within my festival, we presented uh, this performance uh, with Glenna that I co-created with a choreographer. Her name is Lara Kramer. And uh, it was presented at Darling Foundry uh, in the context of my festival and Oftea, and we'll be presenting it uh, in the spring again in a bigger festival. And um, so the piece is about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission or the industry of reconciliation, and uh, but it's more about the, um, the repeated history of uh, commissions and inquiries on Indigenous people by the government of Canada. And it's beautiful words, beautiful recommendations, but very little actions to follow. So this piece we've been uh, staging ourselves with Glenna and her two grandchildren, Joey and Jaden, that you see here, and um, and uh, and it has interviews with Plena about uh, her experience with uh, with residential schools. So I'll just show you a little clip to show you how Plena also. It's the end, Plena. You know when you do your final action. So part of it was also for us. It was imagining what a hearing could be, because hearings were uh, pivotal in uh, the commission process the inquiry and to, to gather the testimonies of survivors and uh, but <clears throat> I mean I'll let you talk about it if you want to talk about it Glenna but it was about your experience going through the process of reclamation which is very uh, fucked up I will use that word because it is very <laughs> fucked up way of getting compensation monetary compensation by the government so we started thinking in our ways how, when you're sharing your story, how can we create a safe space and hold that space that becomes a space that's also uh, safe, nurturing, and healing.
So singing is, we were singing an honor song for her. And what you see on the ground is all the uh, books of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that uh, Joy, the uh, Glenna's granddaughter, was ripping out page by page and then started gluing them on this survival blanket. Kind of like a symbol of uh, a graveyard in a way. And uh, the night before the performance, Glenna called me up. And she's like, I know I'm part of the performance, I'm sitting, but can I perform too? Can I do something? I'm like, well, I'm sure, of course, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to write. And it was, for me, it was, as a performance artist, it was very um, interesting also to work with Glenna because she's a visual artist. But, so for her, this um, performance space was a huge canvas on the floor and makes you um, shift. Your, your way of uh, perceiving things and creating. So she said, okay, well, get me a brush and get me some masking tape and get me some paint and I want you to, uh, to put the brush on my cane. So I was like, okay, well, what color do you want the masking tape? What color do you want the paint? because of uh, when the apology was happening by the Prime Minister Harper, uh, I read something somewhere, I can still read that, okay? And I was on the, computer, on the computer a lot, and I read a statement by this woman, the survivor from, I think she was from Nova Scotia or New Brunswick. And she said, uh, she was talking about her own experience at residential school, and uh, and so, and she had she had written that uh, God was a victim too. When, uh, they were a victim, and God was a victim too. And so that really struck me as very being very strong. It struck me right here. Okay. I don't remember the woman's name, but I uh, I won't forget those words. And uh, so that's what inspired me to write these words that not too many people could understand unless you've been to residential school. So this is what I wanted to get across when I first spoke to Emily about it. So I was very happy to work with uh, Emily and with my uh, grandchildren. And now my grandson, who worked on the project too, now he's 13 and he wants to be, uh, he wants to work in, um, he wants to be an actor. He wants to work in theater. And then my uh, granddaughter, she's nine now. She was, she was uh, seven. Now she wants to be a writer. And, uh, uh, a writer and a poem, a poet. Actually. Yeah, so that's that's something. Artist. And I come from a family of artists too. Many artists are in my family. There's installation artists, uh, painters, and uh, and they're situated somewhere in the United States, in uh, New Mexico, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and uh, in Ontario. Um, and uh, some are quite well known, my nephews, uh, and uh, I was born on the Rama Reserve in Ontario. I'm the ninth one born to uh, 13 children, and um, I think I, uh, oh, one of my oldest brothers lived in Toronto, 
and uh, he would come back with paints, and he uh, he would he would paint. And we never saw that before. We had no TV, we had no radio, and we lived in a two-room shack. Okay, but this was our entertainment: watching him uh, paint. And my and I had a second, uh, third oldest. There was a brother that was five years older than, than me, and we would watch what was going on. And uh, that's how we got interested in art, just by watching my oldest brother, our oldest brother, paint. And I consider ourselves lucky to have had that. Okay. Um, I, I never heard, it's always in my mind these images of what he would be, of what he did with the brush. That influenced my life, our life. Question? First, I want to thank you for this amazing keynote, and also to invite Faye if she would like to maybe also uh, open up, help us open up the conversation. Um, I'm sure there are questions in the audience, but first, thank you for sharing both the images and your collaborative process. Yeah, I, um, yeah, just thank you so much for the gift of all your work and your being here. And hello, Myra. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, so um, one of the things I think is really interesting, just even with some of the last bit of the, your own um, autobiography, and to link it a bit to the morning session, is um, to think about the capacity of telling, of uh, different ways of knowing the world and telling the stories which we were starting to talk about this morning uh, through, I guess, what I would call disability imaginaries we were talking about. But I think there's a kind of interesting, uh, and one of the things that was also very intriguing that you've talked about, Glenn, is your, um, the vision isn't necessarily always about having your, your sight, the external sight, but the other kinds of vision and um, ideas and imaginaries that you carry with it, which we saw beautifully executed in this last video of the piece on the, resident, the failure of the residential school hearings. And, um, so I think one of the questions is just about the importance of bringing these kinds of stories and visions and so forth into the world, which I, is, is, is a continuity from the morning's session as well, that they're alternative ways of um, imagining and being, and they um, are also always politically very rooted in uh, inequalities and the way people's lives are rendered invisible. Um, and I also want to invite Melanie to jump in as well, who's a documentary maker and also works in animation. So I think that these are all projects that we share in common. I think more broadly, it brings up questions of, um, I guess what we call in some circles, like alliances and allyship and what you know ways in which there are intersections uh, for folks with disabilities trying to get alternative ideas about the world out there and also facing different kinds of inequalities that um, render voices invisible, uh, when, when, uh, render people's voices um, less salient, let me put it that way. Um, and I guess the last thing I also just want to bring up, which I think is really important and kind of an emergent area both in both disability studies and indigenous studies is the issue of um, environmental assault and um, extraction and um, the um, you know toxicity that's being produced through these extractive processes which um, are of course often resulting in the disability or, dis or disability of folks in communities where they are not able to um, access clean water or other kinds of um, necessities of life so um, I, and I just think those are some some provocations for that group sorry for my back everyone over here um, so if any of you'd like to address that, or we can fill it open to the audience. I, I'm really grateful to be north of the border of the United States, just to get away from hearing what goes on in the United States. But also just because I think in Canada, whatever the issues are with things like the commission, there's just much more recognition of uh, the importance of intersections with indigenous communities whose land we're sitting on right now. So anyway, I don't... I'm, happy to entertain questions or if you guys want to respond or and, and Melanie maybe you want to say a little bit about the work that you do as well <laughs> you know people who work in documentary they don't ever like to be the object of attention <laughs> I'm really aware of this but I'm just going to put you on the spot 
I'm already like planning her future because I think she needs to be the person to make the film about how to be so bumps away. We need a film made about her. Anyway. Oh yeah. So uh, <laughs> so I'm I'm telling uh, I'm like introducing everything to uh, to Waira over there. But uh, yeah, so I um, I was really touched by what we did over there. Like I was only observing and listening, and uh, it took me a whole year. The first time I saw the images was last last week because it was you know intense moment in our life. So I. I needed to be my my mind needed to be set up for you know going back to that moment and um, well I'm pretty glad what what we made it's pretty incredible well when I'm always telling the story about the trip it's always like you know I went with Glenna who couldn't see much but she was just an adventurer she was like Indiana Jones <laughs> <laughs> and she she was teaching. Uh, painting to kids, and it was all so natural, you know, her hand would remember how to paint, and um, we would just need to describe a few things to her, uh, presenting her the paintings of the kids, and she would, you know, give them, give them advice to what to do, how to improve the drawings, and uh, yeah, I, I came back and I was, like, pretty impressed with that woman, <laughs> she's a, a great model, you know, I, I'm not sure, like, I would say yes like that. <laughs> I was like, you know, 30, and I was like, okay, well, I'll go. It's going to be hot, and uh, maybe there's snakes, and I don't know. And Glenn was just like, let's go, you know. <laughs> let's go into the jungle. And, you know, you remember we went to the river, like the two of us for the first time, before the other girls, and <laughs> you just asked, do you think there, there can be a snake? And I was like, well, you know, maybe, I, I don't know, this river, <laughs> and, we just, and you went into the river with your cane, you know, <laughs> and it was so funny, and I was looking at you, and I was like, wow, okay, you know, when you want to do something, just, you just do it, <laughs> and that was, that was pretty, uh, yeah, that was a good teaching, being with you all those weeks, yeah, I was really moved by, uh, you know, everything I've learned from you, the kids, and that community, I felt like I had to bring this energy home to my own community. And uh, I'm always glad to, to learn from other strong indigenous women like that. So it was, yeah, a good uh, opportunity. And uh, I hope we can do something good with those images because they, they talk a lot and uh, they're pretty, well, I hope they'll be pow as powerful as the, the moment we live together. Well, thank you for calling me strong. You should have told me that to, uh, when we were in Colombia. <laughs> you know, you. we found one fan in the community, and we brought it to um, to you. It was right next to you, <laughs> to your bed, so you could like take some naps and yeah. survive. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, ooh, I'm glad we found that, that fan, because it was so intense in here. The place yeah. we were sleeping. Can I tell the stories of the purging? Auntie? Yeah, the auntie that wanted to purge you with oh, that medicine. Oh, there was, uh, there was one time, uh, well, I, I was a smoker, okay? <laughs> Not on the e cigarettes. <laughs> and I smoked for many years. And uh, so this woman, uh, the auntie of Wyda, she, uh, she noticed I was coughing a lot. And I was coughing a lot more than you heard me here today. And um, so she said, I have, I can make medicine for you. It'll help your cough. So I said, okay, all right. So then, and, uh, and it involves purging, okay? Uh, from both ends. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll be here early in the morning, I'll pick, uh, the medicine, and I'll make it and prepare it for you. So I said, okay. okay. So the next morning, I, uh, I wake up, and she's sitting right on the next bed to me. She's watching me, and she's dressed in pink, yeah? she's a pink dress and a hat. And she had to walk through the jungle 
from uh, like an hour away to where uh, we were. And so she's sitting there patiently. So I said, okay, I, I'm up. And um, and leave up too. And uh, so, okay, I have to take medicine. So I go outside. I'm sitting alone. Because I know I'm going to have to, it has to come out. I'm going to drink it and maybe I'm going to vomit. So, uh, so I'm sitting there and drinking and drinking and drinking and nothing was coming out. Not too much. Uh, and uh, but I finished the drink. And I say, okay, do I, so I go back in and, uh, and the lady says, I told her, well, she knew I wasn't vomiting or anything. Okay, she says, there's one uh, final, final drink I made for you, she says. And uh, so you'll have to uh, drink, it, drink it, and right away you have to go to the toilet, she says. And she brought in a, they brought in a pot for me. Pot, I mean. She said, no, no, just keep, make sure nobody's uh, in the toilet. And uh, so I drank that medicine. It didn't taste what I, all the medicine there doesn't taste good, but I managed to drink it all down. And then I ran for the toilet. <laughs> I had to make a run for it. It's just around the corner, like that. And uh, that's the story. But uh, it didn't work on me either, the medicine. <laughs> I still had uh, <laughs> coughing. Because you didn't take enough. <laughs> I, I think they didn't give me enough because uh, I'm tall too, eh? And uh, I'm bigger than them. Maybe they should have gave, given me a bigger portion. I was uh, writing to Waira that we were talking about disabilities, and so she said, "Well, I have one too. I I miss one finger, yeah. and uh, I don't really, I don't really want to tell her the story of her finger." Uh, yeah. So uh, Waira, as uh, Kim said, she did a lot of radio work, and it was for uh, the International Women's Day in the village next to the community, and they were doing a radio. Um, Radiothon, so the women were coming to share positive stories because it was really in the heat of war. And uh, this man arrived with an axe, and he was a hitman. And he came for her head to uh, to uh, kill her on the head, but she put her hand before, so it's her finger that got uh, that got uh, sacrificed. So. Yeah, so we talk about that in the piece too, because uh, it's part of it. It's also, uh, I mean, the the it's a small town beside people are not very, um, you know, um, being gay is uh, she's been persecuted for that too, um, living with a woman. So there's, uh, it's it's a tough life for sure. But for me, it's been like, I was watching the material this week, and yesterday I got to um, uh, an interview. There's an interview with Klena, and there's an interview with Waira and her mother, and they they speak about uh, losing all her brothers to, uh, to, to the war, and it's, oh, I just started bawling and bawling and bawling and bawling, because it's, it's horrific situations, but it's their resilience that I'm, for me, that's my biggest inspiration because they are very um, resilient. And her mother was telling me that it's uh, the medicine, the, their ceremonies that help. So for them, it's very important to, to have them. And uh, yeah, done. Okay, so there's questions. We have a few minutes to take either comments or questions or reflections on, again, thinking about, I think for me, this really important conversation and panel in the context of what we would call critical disability studies, which wants to create intersections and wants to make intersections and connections with communities. And, and also just the demonstration, I think, also of different practices um, that um, both you're engaged in, but also that you've enacted here for us. So I don't know if people have questions for you, but 
I just wanted to also open up the floor before we have a, a short break. I didn't mean to interrupt your story. But I, I just want to respond to that important and very sobering story, which is. Um, Um, this the, the last comment and uh, why I'm so very sorry for all of the things you've had to endure. Um, but the fact that, I mean, that it, you know, we were going from like the micro activist affordances that uh, Arsley was talking about and the very close intimacy of the, of um, uh, the assaults of medicine and so forth and people finding other ways to tell and visualize stories, but also to remember how huge <laughs> war and violence are in producing disability. It's probably, of course, the biggest source of not just like, well, obviously loss of life, loss of limb and so forth, but also the kind of um, what we would call hidden disabilities of trauma and violence and that are you know, shared across so many domains and that to remember their locations in different cultural places where the people are experiencing it far more than, let's say, up in the global north, for example. But um, anyway, just I think these are just very important points to remember that the scale of uh, how disability occurs and um, the very you know the different kinds of alliances we can make across those scales and different and cultural differences are so important. She says hi to everybody. As you're thinking about art and visibility, I couldn't be there physically, but I'm here with uh, my heart, and I'm connecting with the world from the north. So I've shared a bit of the reflections of the project. Violence is part of our life. If we are artists, activists, community leaders, we are persecuted in my country. And today we are mourning the death of my brother, who was an important leader. And we are being persecuted. And uh, not only a uh, threat to our lives, but also from the government, how they are uh, not uh, supporting our initiatives to protect our territory and protect our ways of life. Yeah. Yeah, the mining companies are Canadian too in her territory. Yeah. There's a few. Texaco is one of them. Andina. She doesn't remember the names, but she's going to research. Uh, there, are, there are a few. There are a few. And you know, si, voy a hablar de la carretera, de cómo eso cambió. Ah, 
So there's uh, international mining companies that are coming into the territory. One that is uh, connecting uh, the countries in that area. And they have to go through our territories. And so they're building roads. Even though the law in Colombia protects our territories, we've uh, created a national park in our territory so we could protect it. And nowadays the government is uh, not respecting um, those uh, laws. And the fact that we as leaders, indigenous leaders, are uh, fighting against that, this is uh, a reason why we get killed. Um, but I can say, you know, from uh, the times I've been there over the years, so just in four years, that's when they started uh, building a road, before it was a dirt road, so it took a lot of time to, to get from the main town to the community, but now there's a road, so you can do it in two hours. And that has changed so much in the community. Now there's a bar that's being built uh, a few kilometers down the river, and because sound travels by water, you can really hear it in the jungle. So when you're in ceremony, they are in ceremony every week. All you hear is the And that scares away the animals. You don't hear the sounds of the, the, the jungle as much. And you can't be in ceremony. You can, you can be connected to the invisible the same way as you are usually. And what also shifts in that is that the people don't go to ceremony, they go to bars now and they get drunk. So it's really shifting the way of life just by civilization or like because of a road, a, a road to for the those multinationals to get access to the territory. Yeah. Sorry, Nick, did you just ask that question again? Yeah, I was just curious who the bar was built for, if it happened at the same time as the road being built. Yeah. <coughs> Emily, could you respond one more time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> To, uh, yes, it was built, I guess, for the people that wanted to have a good time and go to the bar, I guess. They wanted a bar by the river. Like the workers on the river? The workers and the people in the villages, and of course, people from the community go as well. back home, maybe I could bring some of my images back yeah. to show my uh, my own art. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, I just want to thank you very much for the, for the day and uh, for all of you being here. And, uh, I'm happy to see uh, Melanie again. I haven't seen her since uh, we, we, uh, we left this Columbia. One of the amazing reasons for having
so-called academic work together is that we get to see people we love and we get to have uh, re-encounters with them. So with those moving words make me feel quite sleepy actually. I want to just thank you all for being at this keynote and to hopefully have, Ash is going to tell me what to do in a minute. <laughs> I always listen to Ash. <laughs> um, I can make an announcement. Oh, wait, you, and so and to thank Emily, Melanie, Faye, and I've just lost in Glenna for um, for uh, sharing both their work and their stories with us here today. Thank you. And Moira, if you are just and Moira. But, right, and it's like just uh, the, um, it's very powerful to have the example of your alliance and affiliation and intergenerational work as a model of how to move forward despite a lot of difficulty. So thank you, thank you for providing that model for us. I told you you wouldn't have to hear a lot of me, so I'll just be brief. Obviously, we're, we're working in crypt time, which let's give ourselves kudos for that. That's awesome. <laughs> we rock. <laughs> so, um, uh, if it's okay with everyone, we still do have to kind of keep a little bit in capitalistic time because we're at a university. Um, so we're gonna hug it, and we're gonna do. Um, is everyone okay if we do like a 10, 15 minute break? So right now. Um, if everyone can go, um, the, the panel, um, use your brain, actually, and take a minute. Um, so right now, the next sessions, we're going to have two simultaneous panels. So in this space, we're going to do panel 2B, which is the research creation and ethnography. Okay? And then the second panel is going to be in what we call the lunchroom that kind of some people used and some people didn't, but that's cool. It's also our other session area. <laughs> so if you go where the, the, if you go outside of these doors and turn right, on your left hand side, you're going to see another door that says quiet room. Go through those doors, the left will be the quiet room, and then the next door will be the other space that we'll be using. That is where uh, panel 2A, integrated performance, will be. But I will be out there, and you will see me, and I will make sure you're in the panel that you want to be. On that note, um, interpreters and anyone that needs LSQ and ASL, um, we just want to ensure that everyone's going to the panel that they want, but we're obviously um, being aware that we only have two interpreters, ASL. So if anyone needs LSQ and ASL, if you can meet with me in front of this space where the, pan where the interpreters now are, we will figure out what, which panels you would like the interpreters to be in. Uh, and thank you so much. That's it.